Well, I'm always grateful to be back in your presence. It's kind of a once a month thing. I have now started to think of myself as a strange uncle who drops in kind of once a month. You can call me Uncle Jimmy if you want. Um, but the passage I want to deal with today, it has to do with what's the effect of Easter upon us. If Christ is risen, then what? Well, this passage is going to give you a major clue. And in the passage, you're going to hear about three different hearts. And I want you to notice as I'll pause in the reading, there's going to be a sad heart. And then there's going to be a slow heart. And finally, there's going to be a burning heart. And I want you to think what could happen with your heart, with my heart, if we grasp and are grasped by how real this Easter story is. Turn to the 24th chapter of Luke, and we'll hear the story of the road to Emmaus. It goes like this. That very day, meaning Easter, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk. And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And he said to them, and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the women had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, that is Jesus, acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And then one more verse. As they were talking about these things, 
Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Let us pray. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you ignite our hearts so that they would burn as we study your word. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Sad hearts and slow hearts and burning hearts. But let me tell you about a fast heart for just a minute. I wish I was as quick thinking as this young man. He was working in a produce section in a grocery store. And a lady came in and asked, could she buy half a head of lettuce? And he said, well, ma'am, we don't sell them by the half a head. You buy the head or not the head. But, but when I buy one, I'm all alone, and usually the other half goes bad before I've finished. So could I buy just half a head? No, ma'am, you have to buy the whole thing. I'm sure of that. I don't think so. Come on, you can do it. No, no ma'am, I, I, this is my first day here. I can't make, go ask your manager. <sighs> okay. So he goes back in the back room where the manager is, and he blurts out to him, you know, there's this old hag of a woman out there who wants to buy half a head of lettuce. What am I supposed to tell her? And the manager looked horrified. <gasps> because the boy had not seen the woman followed him right back into the manager's office. And he turned around and said, oh, and this lovely lady would be willing to buy the other half. What should we do? That was fast thinking. Shh. The manager was so impressed, later in the afternoon, he came to him and said, you are really quick. That was good. Where are you from? And he said, oh, I'm from Toronto, Canada, where the hockey players are beautiful and the women are ugly. And the manager looked a little concerned and said, well, my wife is from Toronto. And he said, well, which team did she play for? Now, see, that, that's quick. But we're going to talk about slow as part of this sermon. And I'm a little slow. Just a couple weeks ago, this nice family that our, our neighbors were walking out on the street. Their dog, Basil, is good friends with my dog. They love to chase up and down the fence line. And they've got two little girls. And I knew she was pregnant with another baby on the way. And so as I saw her walking... Well, she didn't quite look not pregnant now. And I went, oh, uh, well, now, when was the baby due? Now, she was pushing a baby carriage. And she said, well, the baby came two weeks ago. Oh, I couldn't think of one way to get out of the hole I had just dug. And so I just kind of slinked away, and I see him every now and then on the street, and I know she's thinking, oh, there's that man who's sort of a pastor, but he has no sensitivity at all. So I want all of you to take up your little finger right now. Would you take it up? Take it up, everybody's little finger, and wag it at me, and say, don't do that again. Oh. Okay, our text today happens on Easter afternoon. It's a dismal scene in some ways because there's already been rumor that Jesus has been raised, but nobody's buying it yet. And so these two disciples are going to leave town. Emmaus was not a long way away, seven miles. But they're walking home. They're walking away from the city that caused so much trouble. The enemy had orchestrated a conspiracy in Jerusalem among the Roman powers and the Jewish powers to end the life of Jesus. Judas had betrayed them into their hands. Most of the disciples had run away. They're all in shock. Saturday was very quiet. Now it's Sunday, the first day of the week. People are going to get up and moving back to work. But these two decide we're leaving. The women had come back to the disciples and said he was not in the tomb. The tomb is empty. The angel said he's risen, but nobody's buying it. In fact, earlier in Luke 24, they accused the women of speaking nonsense. So by afternoon, 
these folks are giving up. And that's where we begin, sad hearts. They were downcast. Cleopas is named. The other one is not named. Some think it might have been Luke because he seems to have known the conversation so well. They're discussing what happened. Suddenly, a stranger comes up and starts walking with them. But verses 15 and 16 said they were kept from recognizing him. That's a strange thought. How could you not recognize Jesus? Were they just looking down as they walked and didn't even look up because they were so sad? Were they all wearing some kind of hoodie that prevented seeing in a kind of a horizontal way? Were they, were they in a fog? Was there an eclipse that went on like this week and couldn't see? What, what, what was going on? But somehow they just don't recognize. And they ask him, because he asked them, what are you talking about? Jesus asked lots of questions in the New Testament. 300 questions, which is what we're called, in effect, to be like Jesus, to go ahead and ask questions. What are you talking about on the road? And they said, do you not know the things that have happened? And of course, the irony is Jesus actually knows every one of the events that has happened. But he says, what things? What an interesting way for Jesus to pull them out. What things? What things? But their faces are downcast. They're just sad. And you know, on every church pew and in every kind of home in which this is being broadcast. There, there are people who are still carrying lots of sadness for lots of different things because life didn't turn out quite like they thought it was going to turn out because someone they've loved is lost because a dream has been taken away because there's a physical challenge they never could have imagined. You know, on most pews, you might want to look up and down yours, there's probably a sad heart on most pews. But, but you know, finally, sad hearts don't have to define us. I think you learned that if you were here last Sunday, that life doesn't always go the way you want it to go. Catherine Wolf described that so beautifully. But, but there is sadness that sets in, and sometimes a sadness can even accompany a burning heart. I'm still sad about Brian. It was in January of 2023. I was sitting right over there in the transept. And right through that door over there, Brian and Cameron Beatty came through. And great old friends. And we just had the best hug right there in that aisle. And then we just stood there and we just kept worshiping right in that aisle. And that was the last time I was with Brian. We talked more on the phone. In fact, every now and then, I would have one of those pocket calls, and sometimes he was putting his kids to bed, and he'd go, Jim, what is it? Uh, oh, nothing. That was just my pocket. But I'm still a little sad, and you know, I have not been able to delete his number from my phone. That's kind of weird, isn't it? But that's a sadness. Sad hearts on the road to Emmaus, but to become the people God needs us to become. Do you realize we have to go through some sadness? Reinhold Niebuhr once wrote, we never come to God until we come to the end of ourselves. And of course, you don't come to the end of yourself without some pain. It was Pascal who said, it's good to be weary and worn out in the vain pursuit of the true good so that we may open our hearts to the Redeemer. So this story begins with a sad heart, but that's the way most of us come to Christ. Something is not working and we need something more. And it's on a road like Emmaus where Jesus meets us. Now, the second thing mentioned here is a slow heart. Slow. What things? Cleopas and his friends are able to describe in the past tense, we had hope past tense, that he was the one to redeem Israel. And then they're explaining that some people think he's alive. Obviously, we don't. 
but there's this rumor going around. They're saying lots about Jesus and lots about a resurrection, but they're not ready to believe it. And that's the way some of us are two weeks after Easter. Yeah, that was fun, the hallelujahs, the Easter lilies. It was great, trumpets, but we're not quite ready to let it enter. And so Jesus actually tells them that they were, he uses the word that's translated in English as foolish. It doesn't mean stupid. It's a word that really means failing to put all the facts together. They're foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And then the text says, he began with the whole scripture and started with Moses and moved through the prophets and explained everything about the coming Messiah and how, in effect, he was fulfilling that. Wow, I wish somebody had done a videotape of that little discussion on the road. But I'm sure he took them through Isaiah 52 and 53. I bet they went to Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Deuteronomy 18, Daniel 7, Jeremiah 31. And amazingly, after all that, they don't believe yet. Would you turn to your neighbor and just say, they're not believing yet. After the best Bible study in the universe, turn, tell them, tell them, tell them, they're not believing yet. Oh my goodness. They're slow to believe. The week after Jay John was here, Greg Headington, who's sitting right out there, invited me over to his house so I could meet Jay John. I've never met the man. And I said, well, tell me your testimony. And he said, I went to university. I didn't know anything about the faith. I had grown up Greek Orthodox. The first time I heard the gospel, I said, that's for me. And I've believed ever since, and it's never been the same. I went, wow, well, that didn't happen to me. That was, that was the opposite of slow to believe. That was fast to believe. You may remember last time I was here, I told you that the average conversion comes after hearing pieces of the gospel nine different times, five different people over a two-year period of time. Nine, five, two. So J. John kind of ruins the statistics there, but some of you may be helping on the other side of that. It may have taken you much longer than that. That's the average. But this story is about slowly coming to believe. But here's the good news about Jesus. He never quenches a dimly burning wick. He never quenches a dimly burning wick. So if there's a little flame there left by your parents, left by Sunday school teachers, left by some experience, all it takes is the Holy Spirit to blow on that. Something could change and sure enough, when they sat down with Jesus at the table, Jesus, who was a guest, starts acting like a host. He took the bread. He lifted it up. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to the people who made the bread. And when he did that, it was like, it's you. And then he just disappeared. Poof. Well, then they had to run back. And they ran, you know, seven miles, slow walk, and they had to walk really fast. That's 14 miles in a day. That's a lot of steps on your pedometer. That's a whole lot. So now we've got number three, burning heart. Did not our hearts burn within us as he was explaining all this on the road? Now, they didn't say that when they were on the road. But after they saw him, it was like, oh, oh, did you just see what happened? Huh? And they were just aflame. That dimly burning wick. A burning heart is what so many people experience when they meet the risen Christ. Acts chapter 2. Fire falls with the Holy Spirit. Blaise Pascal had this curious little image in a, sewn into a little piece of paper in his coat that they found after he died that explained something about his conversion. Fire God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not the philosophers, not the scholars. Certainty, certainty, feeling, joy, peace. That's a burning heart. He got it. John Wesley was a little tamer when he described it. He says, my heart was strangely warmed. That's hot language for an Anglican in the 18th century. I mean, that's really hot language. Um, so 
A.W. Tozier has written a book on the fellowship of the burning heart. Tozier had it. Certainly George Whitfield, the preacher of the first great awakening, was trying to take kind of a dull Puritan fourth generation and bring white hot fire to New England and all of the colonies. Oh, folks, there's been some burning going on. Burning hearts. Let me tell you a story about Henrietta Mears. Henrietta Mears was the somewhat outlandish director of Christian education at First Presbyterian Church, Hollywood, California, starting in the 20s and all the way into the probably about 1960 somewhere. She was, without a doubt, the most influential person among the evangelical part of the Presbyterian Church in all that era. She taught more students in her college group that went on to become amazing pastors of the gospel. And they did, um, they have done amazing things, and many of us are kind of the third generation of that. But she was doing a retreat in 1947 on this topic of a burning heart. And what ignites a burning heart? And three of those students in 1947 came to her room after it was over and said, we want a burning heart. How do we get a burning heart? And these three students formed what they called the fellowship of the burning heart. They agreed to do four things, to spend an hour with God every day in Scripture and Bible. They agreed that they would have a godly character and live in ways that honored the Lord. They agreed that they would endeavor to lead somebody to Christ every 12 months and that their desire to live for Christ as a living sacrifice in everything they did. One of those three was Bill Bright, who started Campus Crusade. A second of those three was Dick Halverson, who pastored a church in Bethesda, Maryland, eventually became the chaplain to the Senate. If any of you remember Ron Skates and his benediction, Ron always did the Dick Halverson benediction, wherever you go, etc. Louis Evans pastored Bel Air Prez in California, fourth, I mean, uh, National Prez in Washington, D.C. I'm pretty sure all three of them have been in this pulpit in the Clayton Bell years. They were joined by thousands of others. There's still a website devoted to the Fellowship of the Burning Heart. Becky Tirabasi runs it. When you look at church history, St. Francis, St. Patrick, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, Ignatius Loyola, Joni Erickson Tata, Leighton Ford, Catherine Wolfe, there's a burning heart that just is ignited. What's happening in your heart? See, it can happen while you're even in the midst of still some sadness as you put it all together and realize, oh, God is up to something so marvelous. And my prayer for you in this season at Highland Park is that you become a fellowship of the burning heart. That God just ignites your heart, not by anything but his spirit working with the word and that you become a place in this city that just begins a fire. Because what we need in this world right now is another great awakening. And it starts in a place just like this as you open yourself to this flame. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you descend now upon this congregation in such a way that your fire burns within us such that we might be able to touch people all around with the good news of the gospel in the midst of their sorrow and in the midst of their slowness with a burning heart. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.